Greetings, my fellow space explorators, and welcome to another Warhammer 40k lore video where we talk about the types of worlds in the Imperium. Today, I wanted to bring to your attention two of the more remote, so to speak, and dangerous to live on types of worlds of the 40k setting. And by these, I mean the frontier worlds and the infamous death worlds. For those of you new to my channel, I am the Grim Dark Narrator, or GDN, and I produce Warhammer 40k content every single day for your lore needs. If you enjoy them, please remember to click the like button and maybe subscribe for future content. And if you're a generous servant of the Emperor, you can also help out my channel by going to my Patreon page in the video description. Those being said, let us learn more about these two dangerous types of worlds, shall we? A frontier world is a planet only recently discovered by the Imperium through the explorations of the Adeptus Mechanicus Explorator Fleets, or Rogue Traders, and is the home to a relatively small number of Imperial colonists. The Administratum may not have even had time to fully explore the world, and set up a planetary government. Frontier worlds can serve as a refuge for those who want to escape from imperial oppression, though they can also be a destination for those who want to escape justice, and have a reputation for lawlessness and crime. Frontier worlds occupy the desperate, lawless fringes of the Imperium. Inhabitants quickly learn self-reliance is necessary, knowing that they cannot expect outside aid against marauding bandits or ravenous aliens. As always, where there is little Imperial attention, heresy and mutation festers unchecked. Frontier worlds swarm with violent dregs of humanity, with pirates, bandits, outlaws, and worse, ruling many areas. These planets easily become breeding grounds for rogue psychers, misguided heretics, and vile cultists, and can threaten mankind across the wider Imperium should their contagion spread. Whereas life on any Imperial world is harsh and unrelenting, except maybe for those of high birth, frontier worlds often stand apart. Frequently, there is no Adeptus Arbitae's presence on the planet, and planetary governors might only rule from orbit or from another system altogether. As such, frontier denizens must face many threats on their own, from Xeno's raiders to natural hazards to hostile wildlife or tectonic instability. These worlds are often newly discovered, distant from regular traffic or trade routes, and settled with incomplete or poor analysis of the planet's dangers. Many were found by accident, uncovered from ancient star charts, or mentioned in the margins of a rogue trader's log. Frontier worlds might instead be locations previously inhabited. Many reveal signs of earlier civilizations, ranging from ancient human societies to long-dead alien empires. These remnants of the past might even be the reason for some settlements, or drive exploration to uncover relics from ancient times. While other citizens of the Imperium may have domestic resources or imports to support themselves, frontier worlders are forced to scrape and scrounge for survival. Many are dependent on, or at least familiar with, Imperial technology, and thus their society becomes a mix of refurbished devices and native construction. This can lead to near-barbaric existences, with tribes of chain-axe-wielding renegades attacking settlements for precious Prometheum or last gun sentry arrays guarding isolated homesteads from scary creatures. Still, frontier worlds always seem to attract new settlers. Many come to the borders of the Imperium seeking escape from local religious authorities. Some might wish to worship the Emperor through means deemed heretical or deviant. On a frontier world, they might be able to establish their own sect, and in time perhaps make it the world's version of the Imperial Creed. Not all frontier worlders choose their homes willingly, in search for a better life. Hive populations can be tithed to populate a newly established planet, 
and the entire hab blocks might be stripped bare to begin new lives away from the comforting crowds and metal cities. Penal legions could also be used to establish footholds on empty planets, all understanding that their new lives might be grim but still better than certain death on the battlefield. Existing on the far edges of Imperial law, and often outside the commandments of the Imperial creed, frontier worlders can develop a heretically relaxed attitude towards aliens. Locals wielding Xeno's weaponry, living in habitats crafted for non-human entities, are common. Some frontier outposts even openly trade with traveling Xenos, thus spreading the taint of the alien. This acceptance of the impure can also extend to mutated humans or unholy witches. For frontier worlders, survival requires strange alliances, with lives saved at the cost of souls. To live on the fringes is to exist in shadows, and in the shadows, heresy breeds. Living on a frontier world is often an exercise in daily survival, an existence not as extreme as that on a deaf world, but still fraught with peril. Those who survive learn to rely on themselves, but can still go on as part of a wider society in the Imperium. Given the scarcity of any clearly worthwhile resources, even raw manpower, most of these planets are dived at a relatively low grade. Raising new Imperial Guard regiments might only happen once a generation. For many, the only regular contact with the Imperium might be visitations from the Adeptus Astra Telepathica and its League of Black Ships. Where proper Imperial oversight and societal watchfulness is lax, uncalled psychers can exist or breed with impunity for years before discovery, giving them time to increase in power and danger. This is also true for those twisted in body as well as mind with physical mutants both subtle and gross untamed, especially in the wilder areas. Combating these deviations, missionaries of the Ecclesiarchy often look to those worlds to bring the faith and ire of the Emperor to those sheep who have strayed. Many become martyrs to their holy cause, and their offspring may be called upon to the Scola Progenium and become excellent arbitrators on other worlds of the Imperium. Other natives, though, retain the sense of self-reliance and refrain from becoming part of any organization, living for themselves according to their own code, as countless other frontier worlders do every day. The Death Worlds A Death World is a planet which is too dangerous for a variety of environmental and biosphere reasons to support widespread human settlement. The types of death worlds are varied, ranging from planets that are covered by worldwide jungles, that harbor vicious carnivorous plants and animals, to barren rockscapes strewn with volcanoes and racked by storms. These worlds are nearly impossible to colonize by mankind due to their environmental conditions. Nonetheless, many of these worlds have in fact large human settlements, which are notable for the strength and self-reliance of their people. Many of the people on these worlds are inducted into the Imperial Guard, or recruited by the Space Marines, a fact which is often the sole reason for the continued habitation of these worlds. Some harbor rich mineral, vegetable, animal, or gaseous resources that are of such value to the Imperium, so a small human settlement will be maintained despite all the danger. It has been theorized by the Imperial Magos Biologus of the Adeptus Mechanicus that many death worlds are the result of biological seeding by an ancient advanced high fleet of the Tyranids that entered the Milky Way galaxy long ago. For those of you who don't know, the Tyranids are a horde hive-minded race of creatures that exist pretty much to devour all life on the planets they attack. I will, of course, do a big series on them once I start doing Xeno's lore. Many of the monstrous creatures inhabiting these death worlds, such as the Kraken of Fenris and the Katakan Devil of the jungle world of Katakan, have many features in common with Tyranid organisms, 
and may in fact be descended from them. Left behind by the high fleets that seeded these worlds and then moved on, these Tyranid species lost access to the Tyranid hive mind, and so degenerated into unintelligent yet dangerous animals. On paper, planets classified as deaf worlds should not be inhabited by humans. Often, however, something about these locations requires an ongoing physical presence even though life on the surface is not for the faint of heart or for the faint of body. Everyone must pull their weight and support the larger population or else all face imminent destruction. The threats on these planets can vary tremendously, from aggressive predators to weather abnormalities, but that does not stop humanity from thriving against all odds. Individual roles and adherence to guidelines are crucial to the survival of any deaf world outpost or colony. As a result, life is often regimented and punishment for ignoring assigned tasks is very severe. Those unable to perform the more physical tasks provide support for those who can. No effort is wasted and anyone capable but unwilling is dealt with harshly. On worlds where lack of support from others is a death sentence, the worst punishment can be simple banishment. Should the offender survive, he assuredly would hesitate before repeating the error. While it would be easy to stay in protected habitats, often the need for the planet's resources requires that those who live there engage its deadly environments directly. In many cases, braving the world's threats means protecting the crews harvesting mineral or biological resources. For others, it means making sure that defense systems and other technologies remain operational despite the damaging effects of the planet. Whatever the reason, life is often very short and therefore tenuous. The reality comes with the understanding that the duty to the settlement, facility, or base outweighs the wants and needs of any single individual. People hailing from deaf worlds are scarred individuals, both physically and emotionally. The ever-present specter of death haunts them and can create a sense of detachment that stands in the way of strong interpersonal connection. For most of them, someone near and dear to them has perished, in front of them, in their arms, or in extreme cases, by their own hands. As a result, they tend to be fiercely loyal to the group or larger body they serve, especially when the survival of that group is at risk, but also lean away from individual attachments, lest those people be lost. Deaf world natives are very pragmatic and realistic. Many exhibit little tolerance for indirect options and often rush to action before fully considering all possibilities. Some call this hot-headed behavior reckless. Very few deaf worlders, however, do this out of a passionate need. They see a direct solution and move to execute with as little loss of community resource and lives as possible. Because survival is instilled on a daily basis from birth, they are notoriously difficult to kill. Imperial Guard Tives from these worlds are renowned as some of the fiercest fighting troops in the Imperium. Though some have specialty skills in the terrain of their home world, the combination of resourcefulness, physical skill, and sheer determination makes them capable warriors on any battlefield. As befits such hostile environments, Deaf World natives also make excellent arbitrators as their practical mindset and grit enables them to survive the deadly violence of that position. Those aligned with the Adeptus Mechanicus or the Adeptus Administratum, already fairly pragmatic in nature, also thrive as their technological and logistical skills are perpetually in need. For all of them, the understanding of self-sacrifice for the larger well-being, as well as the rapid thinking processes born from grappling with the constant threat of death, allows them to find effective solutions quickly when time is of the essence. And this, my friends, has been what I wanted to tell you about the frontier worlds and death worlds for today. Which of these did you find more interesting? I think they're both pretty bad places to live on. 
let me know in the comments below, along any other thoughts or questions you may have. I thank you very much for watching, and we'll see you next time. The Emperor Protects